Goedemorgen familie, baie welkom bij ons paas vrijdagdienst. Ons is zo so blij dat je kan inschakelen en deel wees van jullie wonderlijke gebeurtenis op je christen kalender. Ons bid dat die Heere jou familie zien en al jou geliefd is in die tijd en specifiek die dag. Ons wil ook sê baie geluk, al was so baie verjaarsdag, we had so many birthdays this week, Eben Grace had his birthday, celebrate his birthday, then also a Beverly Reineke that was married the other day, also had her birthday, God bless you, en vandag vir jaar, Reine Wilson, um, ons sê veel baie geluk en die Heer is een sien, and then Cedric Simmons, it's his birthday today, now Cedric, for all of us who know him, he's always the well-dressed person, man in church. He is 60 today, 6 zero. He is he doesn't look a day older than 48. And I believe it's because of his wife, Lydia, <laughs> looking so well after him. So Cedric, we are praying for you. And we pray that this year, your 60th year, will be an amazing year. By God's blessings. Kom ons luister na Michelle's boodskap vanochtend. Hello family, it's wonderful to be spending um, this Good Friday with you. Today we're going to look at the crucifixion of Jesus and then on Sunday Chris is going to minister to you on the resurrection. So we're going to start off by just a quick recap before I get to the scripture um, and we're going to um, just quickly run through. So Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, um, just outside of Jerusalem. Peter denies Jesus three times. Jesus is literally moved from the one to the other to the other ruler, from Pontius to Pilate, as the saying goes. And um, eventually Barabbas was set free on the people's um, the people demanded that Barabbas be set free and Jesus would be crucified. So we're going to pick this story up from the word um, at that point. And um, it was custom in those days for somebody to be set free um, over Passover. So this is what happened. And Jesus was sent to the, to the cross. So you can find this account, the account of the crucifixion in the Bible, in all four of the Gospels. You can find it in Matthew 27, in Mark 14, Luke 23, and in John 19. Um, we're going to start off with reading a portion from John 19, and we're going to look at verse 16 to verse 30. So if you can page in your Bibles to John 19, verse 16. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. And it says, Then he delivered him to be crucified. Then to be crucified. Then they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. In Latin, it's called Calvary. It's a skull-shaped hill in Jerusalem. So verse um, 18 continues and says, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the center. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. The me then many of the Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Therefore the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write, The King of the Jews. But he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when he had, they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to each um, soldier part, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. They said therefore among themselves, let us not tear it, but cast lots, lots for it, whose it shall be. And that the scripture might be fulfilled, says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. Now they stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister Mary, um, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples whom he, disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, Behold your son. Then he said to the disciples, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. 
And then the next, the heading of the next um, scripture in verse 28 is, it is finished. Now, um, the Greek word for, for that is the telestai, and it literally means it is finished. And it's actually only found in the Gospel of John twice, in verse 28 and in verse 30, in um, John 19, the telestai. So it says, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, so all things were now the telestai, it is finished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge of sour wine, put it on his up, and, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished, the telestai, it's finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. We find the same account in the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and, and John, as I've said. But I would like to read Jesus' death on the cross to you from Matthew 27, and we're going to look at verse 45 to 56. So while you are paging to Matthew 27, um, I wonder how many of you have seen the film, The Passion of the Christ. Um, I have only seen it once, and honestly... Uh, it's extremely emotional to, to watch it. I cannot begin to understand what it must have been like for these people who have lived through this with Jesus in those days and what it must have been like for Jesus um, living through all of this. If you haven't seen the movie, then I would really suggest it's a really good and scriptural account of what happens in the gospel, of, of, the, the, of what is being told in the Gospels. So Matthew 27, verse 45 to verse 56, and, and again I'm reading from the New King James Version. Jesus dies on the cross. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth, ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there, when they heard that, said, This man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran to took a, and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, let him, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come and save him now. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the graves of his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to Mary. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. And many women who followed Jesus from Galilee ministering to him were there looking from, on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. Then we're going to turn to John 19, verse 31 to 37 in the New King James I'll be reading to see the account where Jesus' side was pierced. So John 19, 31 to 37 says, Therefore, because it was the preparation day that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that, that Sabbath, Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs um, might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other two who were crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with his spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, so that you may believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled, that not one of his bones shall be broken. And again another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. It wasn't just the story. John tells us here that it's the truth. It was prophesied centuries before 
that Jesus was even born. We'll now turn to the book of Mark, verse, uh, Mark 15, verse 42 to verse 47, to look at Jesus' Jesus's burial, and um, it was done in Joseph's tomb. So if you have found Mark 15, verse 42 to 47, let's read that together. It says, now when evening had come, because it was the preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph, a prominent council member, was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went into Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate marveled that he was already dead. And summoned seeing the centurion, he asked him if he had been dead for some time. So when he found out from the centurion, he granted the body, to Joseph. Then he bought fine linen, took him down and wrapped him in the linen, and he laid him in a tomb which he had been hewn out of the rock, and rolled a stone against the door of the tomb, and Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph observed where he was laid. Now in the uh, first century, crucifixion was commonplace, and it was a, a very obvious way to die, um, but it was um, there's not much said on Jesus' crucifixion. Um, we, can, we can assume it's because it was such commonplace in the first century and um, they knew exactly how it happened. So and it was really a, a, a horrible kind of death, except for the extreme painfulness of the death. It was also a very shameful way of dying in those days. And... Um, they would do it in a very public and open place. So it would be in a theater or on a, a big road or a crossroad or hill where people would travel by and see these people hanging there and dying in shame. So um, the cross was a public symbol of indecency and it was made not to merely kill, but it was really made to humiliate and bring utmost shame to the person hanging on the cross. So a, a sign of humiliation. It was also not only meant to break your body, but also to break the spirit. It was a public display. It was referred to as the most cruel and disgusting penalty. It was so indecent that the Roman law actually forbid death by crucifixion. Now remember in John 19, we read that John tells us this is the truth. This is a true account. It's not just a story. So why was it prophesied centuries before Jesus' birth? And what was the significance of that? You can find that in Romans 3, verse 23, and I'm reading the first portion of verse 23. It says, for, we are, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Nobody's excluded in all. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So whether you're the president, the pastor, or the pavement sweeper, the Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all need Jesus in our lives. And Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. Who wants a death? Jesus has come to bring us life and life in abundance. We don't need to burn sacrifices for our sin. Jesus did it all when he died on the cross for us. He was our final sacrifice. He was the Passover lamb. And in explaining that a little bit, um, Passover meal mainly consisted out of the main meal would be the lamb. Um, a lamb without blemish, blemish and no broken bones. So a perfect lamb that would be sacrificed and that would be the main course of the Passover meal. So Jesus really became the Passover lamb dying on that cross for us. He was without sin when he died on the cross. And the Bible accounts that not, not a bone in his body was broken. So he has become our Passover lamb so that we don't have to do sacrifices. Jesus has done it all on the cross for you and for me. So remember in Egypt when, um, the, when, when God sent the plagues and he said to the Israelites, now um, take the blood of the lamb and, and, and um, paint it above your doorways, then I will pass over your house so no plague would come to their house. Pass over the house. John teaches us that Jesus became our Passover lamb. At the baptism of Jesus, his disciples said, Behold, the Passover lamb. His blood washes away our sin. And when God looks at us, 
when we've repented and surrendered our lives to Jesus, what he sees is the blood of Jesus. We are covered by his blood. We are washed and cleansed by his blood. Do you remember that old song that says, Oh, the blood of Jesus, it washes me whiter than snow. It was shed so that we could be reconciled with God, so that we could um, turn from our ways and, and be reconciled to God, that he, all our sin and shame Jesus took on the cross for us so that the world would repent of our sins. Nobody is, is excluded in that. Let us read from Colossians 1 and verse 19 to 23. It says, Reconciled in Christ. For it pleased the Father, Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him where the things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of the cross. And you, who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight, if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven of which I, Paul, became a minister. All are included in this. You are all. We are all. 2 Corinthians 5.15 says, And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. And Chris is going to minister on that next week. The resurrection of Jesus, the power of the that there is in the resurrection of Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but I love gifts, and I'm pretty sure most people really like a gift. Um, Jesus is the greatest gift. Romans 6, verse 23. I, I read for, for the, a portion of Romans, um, 20, Romans 6, 23 to you, but I would like to read the rest of that verse to you. It says, I read to you, the wages of sin is death. But then it also says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's a gift and it's free. It's yours. The only thing you need to do to receive that gift is to accept it. To say, thank you, Jesus. I take this gift and I'm making it my own. Today is your day to receive your free gift. Everything that he did on the cross was for you. And the power of what happened that day on the cross is still very much alive. Nothing has changed. He did it all for you, just as powerful as when it happened more than 2,000 years ago. I invite you to make this decision today, to surrender your life to Jesus. If you have never done that, then today is your day to receive your gift, your free gift of eternal life. If you have maybe dwelled away from from, from, from Jesus and his word, then today I invite you. He has never turned his back on you. He's waiting for you with open arms to come home to him. So this is your invite to, to receive this gift today. He will wash your sin and make you brand new. I want to pray a, a prayer, but I would like you to right there where you are. Jesus wasn't ashamed to die on the cross for you. So you don't be ashamed. Say these words out loud. Say it with your mouth so that your ears can hear it and your heart can believe it. So please pray these words with me. Let us close our eyes and, and repeat this out loud. Say, Lord Jesus, today I give you my life. I give you all of me. I'm not holding anything back. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for shedding your blood for me. And thank you for giving me the free gift of eternal life. Today, I am your child. Today, Father, you are my God, and I will serve you from this day on, and I will live passionately for you only. Today 
is the first day of my new life in you. All my sin has been washed away. I'm a new person in you. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, Amen. If you have prayed this prayer today, the angels are throwing a party in heaven. They are celebrating the word says. And we'd like to celebrate with you. On your screen, there's an email um, the address that says prayer at cfc.za.org. Please send us an email. Let us know. We'd like to come alongside you and cheer you on on this brand new journey that you have started today. We are proud of you and um, uh, we are excited for what life holds for you from this day on. Now, in the, on the day of Jesus' betrayal, Jesus had a, a supper, a last supper with his disciples. And the Bible says to us as believers, do it as often as you like in remembrance of me. So if you have your communion ready, get it ready. If you don't, then quickly go and gra grab anything. It can be literally anything. It's just a symbol. So um, at churches, we usually do grape juice and um, we do uh, bread or wafer, but it can be anything. So go grab a glass of water, anything that you can get, just to symbolize um, the death of Jesus, his blood and his body that was broken. So if you have it ready, I would like to start with, or while you get it ready, I would like to read to you the account of the, the Last Supper where it was instituted in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23 to 26. It says, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So take your piece of bread and let's, let's eat it. And just for a second, close your eyes and thank God in your heart or out loud with your lips, however you feel comfortable for what he has done for you. So thank you, Jesus, for giving you yourself as a sacrifice for us, for your body that was broken on the cross for us. And then the, the scripture continues and it says, in the same manner, he also took the cup of the supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. You don't have to wait for communion Sunday. You can do this every day of the, of the week, of the, of the year. You can do it more than once a day. This is all up to you. It's just a symbol and a, and a way of showing our appreciation and our thanks and remembering what Jesus did on the cross for us. So let us drink whatever it is that you are drinking with us today, your juice or your water, just to symbolize the, the, the blood of Jesus um, and that he has washed away our sin. So that scripture said that it's a new covenant in my blood. Jesus has given us a better covenant, a new covenant, and you are now in covenant with Jesus and with God the Father. And then the scripture continues in the last verse, verse 26 says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim, proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Let us not forget what Jesus has died for on the cross. Let us remember it. In, as we take communion and as we share our lives with one another and telling the account of what Jesus did, let us share the good news and the good covenant that God has brought us. And let us remember to always give thanks in everything for what Jesus has done. We love you and we wish you a wonderful and a very blessed Good Friday.